if you use the Bible enough to have heard of a character named um, David, which, and then you have um, the Goliath giant. If that boy came out there and slung a rock and hit that giant in the center, which is how the Bible describes it, and down he went. And then he went over and took a large, bigger than him sword and cut his head off. Okay, now if you, if you saw somebody do that, almost no matter what happened later, <laughs> you'd be like, that's David, okay? He, this brother man was David to me. No, I'm good with this because I ain't gonna do one take. Man, I'm going, I'm out of here, man. I already told Mr. Member to start my dinner. Come to hell or high water, y'all can get it if you want to. <laughs> He always reduced himself to, he's just a piano player from Tennessee. Like, not different from just a, you know, carpenter from Jerusalem or something, right? I mean, it's like, uh, maybe not that simple. His wit was so sharp, it's mind boggling. His intelligence, to me, I don't use the word genius, but I, I, I guess I just, you know, he was an incredibly bright, intellectual guy. Even as I close my eyes, I see a man who was gifted and talented. I also see a man that was wounded um, on a lot of levels. Some of those things he wrote about, but some of those things he didn't write about. You just had to be around him to see how he lived it, and it came out in other, in other ways. The best music it tends to be very honest. You know, as a musician, you're exposing yourself. So with the best musicians, obviously people feel a very deep connection to them without knowing them. And they're right, they do have a deep connection to them. Saw my daddy meet the mailman And I heard the mailman say Now don't you take this letter too hard now to me They've laid off nine others today But he didn't know what he was saying You could hardly understand that he was really sweeping up pieces of a man. When I met him, I think there was just a good there was a good connection between us. He didn't seem at all surprised I was there and that I'd showed up. He kind of felt like he'd been expecting me. Um, and it felt like there was a reason to be there. You know, ostensibly the reason was I was going to say to him, should we make a record? He wasn't like, he was like, yeah, that'd be great. He was, he was like, yeah, okay. And, but I, even that was, that was a big thing because he, he's not someone who was shy about saying no to things he didn't want to do and spent his whole career saying no to things that he didn't like the, like the feel of. Gil's father had moved on and so we shared my father. So there were years where he'd come over to my house two, three times a week. We'd talk and he and my father would stay up late, one, two, three o'clock in the morning on a school night, talking about ontogeny recapitulating phylogeny in, in the, the Yankees. Gil had a great sense of humor. He was light, but he was deep. He had a, a ring notebook that he would fill with songs every two or three weeks. And it had the patina of dancing shoes. I mean, it wasn't neat and clean. It was, it was sloppy, but it, it had some incredible stuff in it. The story of him writing his first book where he um, uh, dropped out of college and his, it wasn't a popular decision amongst anybody because I think that by the time that Gil got to college and by the time that he had 
been around all of these academics, they knew that he was an academic. They, you know, these people know it's like you, it's like hearing Whitney Houston or Aretha Franklin for the first time. You just, you just know that some people are just blessed, <laughs> you know, with certain things. And Gil was just blessed with these words and his understanding of things. When my father started reading some of the stuff Gil wrote, he felt it should be published. And, and he introduced Gil to his publisher. And Gil dedicated his first book to my father. I think it was toward the end of the summer, but the musical version of uh, The Revolution Will Not Be Televised came out. Within, I would say, the first two or three weeks that I had had a copy of that record, school opened up and somebody who was more in the know at Johns Hopkins than I was <laughs> explained to me that the person who made that record was a student at Johns Hopkins. I would say probably within two or three weeks of that, everyone was going to Gill's apartment to watch him and uh, his collaborators develop new work. You meet artists, um, and sometimes you have to peel away the layers to kind of understand their special gifts, and they keep it very much under wraps. And then some people walk in in a blaze of glory um, with that special magic just draped all around them. And Gil is one of those people. He's also one of those people who every word, every, every encounter is so idiosyncratically wonderful. Uh, it's really remarkable any time spent with him. I used to have a dozen roses sent to my mother from here every two weeks. And Angelo was the guy who took care of them. The guy that I just talked to, good man. In my lifetime, I've been in towns but there was no freedom of future around. All I can think of are chapters in Caesar of all of the places we've been. In. The door opens, and it's one of those things, not to be cliche, but you know, when when somebody with that you know when somebody walks into a room, it was definitely that presence. But in the coolest way, and this is the beginning of explaining maybe my, uh, what I think is the most powerful thing about him, which is that it was incredibly present and uh, filled the room, but in the most gentle way, you know? It was like love had just walked through the door. <laughs> it was something like that. Um, yeah, and we were in the studio and, and began to work, but hung out for a while. That was always his way. It was like we had to, you know, be with each other for a good while before we could do anything. And the doing something came so naturally out of the being together. One has to just be prepared to understand and work with genius. Because he was a genius. And he had his ways, as many people who are genius have. Um, but the thing we had to understand is that, you know, he had a very private side, but deep inside he had a big heart and wanted to things because I remember we played some shows for people and I said are you sure you want to do this <clears throat> and he says yes and these were not financially successful but we we're trying to help somebody who needed help you know and we would call those sometimes well we're gonna do one of the brother man shows <clears throat> um, what he was doing he was caring about people he was trying to support and he was not um, without complication and so one had to just be ready for anything it just, it was exciting. I mean, it was like having a sort of new, sort of new, unpredictable, quite wild friend, where there was always going to be something, something sort of interesting going on. And there was going to be, you know, and there was stuff happening, you know, and we were making, and we were making stuff. And that's always a, you know, that's always a, an exciting relationship, you know. I mean, it's not, he's not a, a Girl Scott Heron's music is not something like, it's not, it's not light, it's not casual. It's like, there's an intensity to what he says and a feeling. And he used to talk about feeling being such a special part of music. Once he was sat at a piano and he went, he went, I know people who can play from here to here. 
and then go all the way up and down. I don't feel anything. And feeling is what it's about. I'd just seen him live and had my head and my kind of feet blown off just by his uh, his kind of deeply contagious and, and affecting sounds and, and words. And so I had a kind of deep desire just to go and meet the person who'd created that sound because I was, I really was blown away by, by the performance. I also had a record on me that I'd managed to pick up in a secondhand record shop in Edinburgh, which was an old um, recording from a, a reggae sunsplash from, from 1980. And it had a, a performance of Gill doing that song of his, Shut Him Down. And it was a kind of bootleg, basically, and uh, an old Jamaican bootleg. And I got backstage um, and said a big thank you to begin with, Tim, for the performance and just told him I'd just recently kind of got into his stuff. But um, I was kind of quickly hooked and, and that I wondered if he might sign this record. and. Uh, he took one look at the record and he was like, what the fuck's this man? He'd never seen this record before in his life and he thought that was pretty amusing that, um, that he'd never seen this particular piece of vinyl. Anyway, he signed it for me and, uh, and that began, uh, you know, really the beginning of a, a long friendship and the first of, of many, many meetings and uh, times we kind of hung out and laughed and talked and, and chatted about all sorts of things. Hello, baby. Hello. I got you. I know you got me. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> I volunteered. <laughs> <laughs> Just his face right away, you just knew this is going to be great, you know, this is going to be fun. And uh, and we sat in the train and we talked and he had, you know, he had one ear for, for what I said and the other ear he was listening to a ball game the Mets were playing. I know, that I forgot who they were playing, but the Mets was his team. And, um, you know, we just talked and laughed and didn't even really talk about photography or what we were going to do. Right away, he made you feel comfortable, and I don't know, just, he made you laugh. You know, he like, he, he had such a way of encouraging you to laugh. I was talking to somebody the other day, and they said, you know, they said, if you walk into a room with Gil, you are instantly with the smartest person in the room. And that was, that was, that was, that was really true, you know. Just the way he thought about stuff, he'd always, he'd always question, you know. You'd never slip anything just by him, just like, even if it was something he asked you to do and you did it, then you thought you did it correctly, you know. He fucked you for a minute about it, just because he's, he's like that. He came to the house and he says, Oh, Mimi, you know a brother named Gil? And I said, Yeah. I said, what, what is it? And he went downstairs and brought Gil back upstairs. That was the first day Gil came in. And that's where Gil moved in. He said, I'm not going nowhere. <laughs> and he was there from that point on. He got a job of peanut butter, 
put a loaf of bread underneath his arm, get his sodas, and he disappeared in the room. And all you could hear the well is him. He had a typewriter. He liked the brother with a daisy wheel. And he'd be standing there and, and, and you go to sleep and wake up and he's still in that same position. That was his thing. He knew his lines. He knew everything it was when it came to him putting something on paper. He did that very well. Uh, I met Mr. Heron uh, because he was in need of a bass player. He was getting ready to uh, open up for Maxwell, who was going on tour. And uh, he also wanted to welcome himself into the world of computers. He never bought anything expensive. And even the computer, he ended up finding a computer. He said it fell off the back of a truck. And he wanted me to hook it up for him and fix it. And um, there were some parts I needed. And whenever he needed money for something, he used to keep it in um, small VHS uh, cases. So he'd pull out a case, and then the money would come out. It'd be like a jack-in-the-box. And he'd just grab a wad and say, here, just take that, keep the rest. And one day, he kind of paused me. He was a little agitated with me, because I would always bring the money back. And he said, I'm trying to teach you how to uh, call for people to treat you. You know, so this is the, the, the level of worth that you need to begin to value yourself at and your time. Yes, and my friends all say they know. Friends all seem to know what I should do with my life, how I should run my life, what should be happening in my life. Yeah, they're on the other side. They're on the other side. I'm on the inside. They're on the outside. I'm on the inside. They're on the outside. Yes, we need to go. Since he was such a voracious reader, um, his writing was easy because the thoughts that came to him, he already had the basis to what he was trying to say. So he could put it together just for because he was smart. And, I, and th some of the some of the smart you have street smarts and you have book smarts and you know he had both and so if they're it, I think it just made life easy for him and that's why some of the one-liners came so fast because um, he was prepared for everything but he would just say it in a way that you weren't expecting. I think that with being an expert person of wordplay so if you want to call it uh, rap later if you want to call it uh, poetry later uh, if you want to call it a song later. He was a master wordsmith. And what we're talking about is the way he would organize words. So just like in English, we say things a certain kind of way, but in Spanish, it's inverted sometimes. Instead of, you know, can I get that? They say, can that give me? Or, or if you're talking like Yoda and you invert words differently. So he had his own speech pattern that um, he would invert words or interject them just a way that people hadn't thought of yet. Um, more so in, in regular conversation, and we do it a lot in poetry, but it was uh, remarkable to watch that spin. Um, and people would want to steal it. Like he would say a verse, a line, and somebody like, wow, I'm gonna use that one. Like he would just give, give people the gift of words. I wasn't even a household name in my own household. But all of a sudden they started to grow up and ask me what they missed. I said, most of my life. <laughs> but it's all right, because <laughs> that's all of yours. Gil spoke the way he wrote, and he just, yeah, it, and he spoke it exactly like he was telling a story, and he was like in another plane, and you were in a book with him, or you were in a film, or you were in the story with him, and so you became part of the story with him. And that's why when you walked away from Gil, you felt like you had absorbed something. You felt like you had, you'd got a little cleverer, or you had, I mean, it's gone. It's like something you could barely hang on to, but in that moment, you walked away and you felt enlightened in some way, shape, or form. You know, I mean, it's very, it's very, very profound, very profound words he, that, that he had that, 
when we were recording them, to me it was like, well, I don't know if this record is going to be like a uh, number one pop record, I doubt it is, but this will be something that means a lot to people. Um, because of what he was saying was so real. I mean, that's, that, that's the only language Gil spoke. with which you commit yourself to something intangible may well turn away the support that could sustain you. What you will need is help that exceeds understanding. There may be disruptions on every level by those you try to touch who shy away from you because understanding is not what you're looking for. Your only hope for stability on levels of togetherness beyond understanding is trust. Anyone who claims to love you knows they will not understand every element of these things that you need and that is where trust must carry the two of you the rest of the way. The truth you're seeking to write about, to sing about, to make sense of for others is something that you pursue not because you've seen it, but because the spirits tell you it is there. He was a person who never stopped creating, you know, and, and on various levels. He never stopped creating. It was really the, um, the cycles of, of society and people at certain ages who came back around to him and said, hey, I listened to so-and-so, you're amazing. Can I record you? Will you come on tour with me? Will you do this? But it wasn't really him going out and, and scavenging for attention or for another deal or for another book publisher. It wasn't really that at all. Uh, so was he enamored or crazy about, no, I don't, I don't think he, um, I don't think it moved him as much as it moved us. And some of his more notable works, even in his past, didn't move him as much as it moved us. The things that moved the vulture and the nigger factor, that, I mean, he still was pretty much on that. So some of his first works, those were the things that he not necessarily crystallized himself at, but those were the things where he was still kind of screaming out, you still didn't get it. I wish you guys would read it again, please. You didn't get what I was saying. Take my hand You're the one I need to understand For a better day There were some rough spots, and who doesn't have rough spots in their life? You know, the ability to fall down happens, but it's important how you get up, that you get up. And I, th I, thought, he, I thought he was good at that. I, you know, I, I thought he was on this recreating himself. I mean, the fact that he put out an album. You know, one of the funny things I re remember, just a quick, quick quip, um, my, my son had asked him once, he said, Gil, when are you going to come out with something new, some new music? So um, Gil looked at him <laughs> and he says, have you heard everything I did? He says, no, I haven't. There's your new music. <laughs> so much like highly charged, tremendous stuff, right? I mean, it's cool if you take a break and don't do nothing for a while, I would think, you know, because it must have taken some toll on him mentally and emotionally to go all the way down into himself to talk about some of the stuff that he talked about. He would call me, kind of noon UK time, I'd get a call, and um, it would be Gil, which I guess was early morning his time in Harlem, sharp as a button. And, and I always used to just, a lot of the time when I was in the middle of it all, I would just think, why, why does he want to talk? What are we talking about? 
I, I learned pretty quickly he didn't want to talk about the album or the campaign at all. And as long as I respected that, he would give me answers now and again that we might need. It was great just to talk to him. He was so funny and intelligent. Then you have the kind of conversations with him that you just kind of take away forever. Um, I think that's a relationship, if you sort of call it that, that I don't think any other relationships really affected me as much as that. There were frustrations sometimes through working with Gil because he wasn't always, you know, be somewhere when he agreed he would be there. But to be honest, those happened pretty rarely and were more than outweighed, compensated by the incredible things that he gave to me, but also he gave to other people. I was totally up for doing what needed to be done to, to support Gil, and, and that really could take many different forms. And, um, you know, I don't regret a single thing I ever did for him or, or every, any time I waited for him or any loan that was made at any point or any kind of amount of effort that was made to kind of support his work because I, I think he was and, and remains a, a kind of a, an absolute inspiration and a, and a genius, you know, and someone of, of real integrity and of real significance, kind of lasting significance in terms of what he had to teach and, uh, and the way in which he had to teach it was, was uh, in itself a beautifully infectious and, and kind of multifaceted and complex message he had. This was not someone who could be reduced to sound bites and, uh, and someone who was able to understand life in all its complexity and, uh, and difficulty. The sad part of Gil, for me, is that, you know, most people who do drugs do drugs either in their teens, in their 20s, and they stop in their 30s, or they continue and they're dead in their 40s, so to speak. Gil, I've always said this, lived on the curb. The curb meaning he should have been dead in the street, but he was never dead in the street. But he never stopped, so he was never standing on a sidewalk. He lived the life on the curb, and somehow that was his life. He is a person who lived the blues. There's some people who sang the blues. So when he said he was a bluesologist, he was telling the truth, because he lived the blues, and we lived it with him, because you know, we were there for a lot of this. So I would say, deep inside, you know, he was a very special person. It's just that he had to live the blues, and he did. I've been down in Pennsylvania, where I was working in the I've been down in Cincinnati, let me out to your seminar. They really got me looking everywhere. Ain't too sure about what I find. You can't think where I'm going. Oh, that's like somebody's telling you. You ain't no place. I can't say that up. I can't say that up. When you move somewhere, the first thing that you try to do is get in touch with your music, you know, find out where the music is, you're going to be moving also. I set the radio, turn all the way down to the right, over there where they keep the black people's music. That's just a coincidence. Everywhere you go, we be over in this corner here. You know, somewhere north of 13, you'll find You know, over there. In 1984, the year that I met Gil Scott Heron, I was just barely 18 years old uh, when he came to do that performance at the Royal Court. Um, I had spent nine years in local authority care. Um, I had emerged from that period in care, uh, semi-literate. I'd been flung into a, onto the streets with 100 quid from social services. I was kind of like alone and I was very lost. So for someone like Gil Scott Hearn to take an interest in someone like me um, was almost unbelievable, almost inconceivable. Um, it turned out that Gil Scott ended up becoming my mentor, my teacher, a father figure to me, um, and someone who trained me in the music industry, um, trained me as a poet. I ended up publishing my own books. Um, he trained me as a, as a businessman. I ended up running my own record company. One of the things that 
helped me to understand in later years why Gil had done that was um, on the last tour that I did with him. It was the last night on that leg of the tour and we were in Rome and um, Jamie Bing, uh, Gil's publisher, brought some footage um, that he'd shot of Gil on the evening when he was performing at the Royal Festival Hall on that tour. Jamie had had the footage edited and he was coming on the last night to meet Gil in Rome to present the footage to him. And as we watched the footage, I couldn't help but cry. I, I literally cried. Um, and, and what made me cry was when Gil started talking in the interview with Jamie about why he did what he did for people, why he helped people in the way that he did. And he referenced his grandma. And when he was growing up in Jackson, Tennessee with his grandma, um, he had um, a set of values that were inculcated in him by her. And one of them was that if you could help someone, why wouldn't you? Now that may sound like a very simple thing to say, and in normal conversation, it might just pass without even having the slightest um, relevance. But to me, it was probably the most relevant thing that anyone could have ever said because coming from Gil, I had realized at that point, I was 45 years old, how much he actually changed my life. And the reason he changed my life was because when he was growing up, some really kind person who I never met, his grandma, said to him that if you can help someone, then help them. And he could, and he did, and that someone was me. And if you let me, here's what I'll do. I'll take care of you. I'll take care of you. I just felt like the way he treated me, I felt like, wow, I'd like to be more like that myself, you know, more welcoming and open. And, and even just walking with him around public and seeing how he, he, was, he dealt with strangers and people on the street and, I don't know, involving people, you know, making people feel part of, of life or, or the situation you're in. You know, it wasn't really important making an album, making a video, making, a, making photographs. It wasn't important, you know, like playing live was important and interaction with people was important and, you know, money's not that important. All those things, I, I, I like that. That really impressed me. Um, yeah, I think it sort of gave me something to aspire to more. He wasn't someone that fell into your life softly either. He'd shake you up in a massive way. There was no kind of escape from it. And I think he made you face realities about yourself um, that just, yeah, changed you irrevocably, basically. Definitely. I mean, that, the experience changed me, and he as a person has changed me. I think by just raising the bar on how we are and should be as people. Let me take these two lines to say that I'm sorry I wasn't there yesterday. But look for me around two o'clock, because right now that's when I'm planning to stop. This note is to allow my favorite trio a chance to get set for old soulful Mio. I'm doing this in case I don't stop to say thanks, since I'll be in such a hurry to get to the bank. I that explains why the bell I spent so much time on this fine document. What I'm sitting here to sign means more to me than dotted lines. What I'm preparing to do right here will be the high or low point of my career. 35 years of piano playing, 35 years of poetry saying, 27 years of record making, 47 years of rule breaking, a final test for the spirits I follow, the rejection of $400,000. But since I ain't as rich as J. Paul Getty, please, if you can, get at least one check ready. To Steve and Vera and Randy, no weed, no beer, and no brandy. But for giving my spirit such a lift, 
cocktail will be for each of you a personal gift. Signed, Gil. See, this, this, this lady, this lady deserves the credit for the song. So like, um, on the album that we did called Winter in America, there was no song called Winter in America. It was just like this, this concept of mine. And there was a lady who was the, the, the mother of a guy I went to school with, went to Lincoln with, named Mrs. Peggy Harris. We did the collage on the inside of the on the inside of the vinyl, like a uh, beautiful lady. Like, like uh, her her joy was doing paintings and collages and that kind of thing. So so we we asked her to do a collage for us to to highlight what was going on on the Winter in America album. And she kept saying, "Gil, there ought to be a song called Winter in America." And I kept saying, "Nah, nah, 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 nah." But but uh, but actually. <laughs> Actually, she was right. So, so for folks who were looking for the Winter in America song, though, it was not, it was not on the Winter in America album. That was kind of curious, but, but uh, the concept of Winter in America was like a, a, a feel-like thing. And from the Indians, welcome the pilgrims to the buffalo. Went through the pain Like the vultures Circling beneath the dark clouds Looking for the rain Yeah, been looking for the rain Just like city That stagger on the coastline Living in a nation Just can't take much more Like the forest they buried beneath the highway Never had a chance to grow Well, they never had a chance to grow And now it's winter Winter in America It's a time when all of the healers have been killed, uh, been betrayed. Say, people know it's something wrong. Everybody ought to know when to hurt. Seems like winter in America. But the truth is, there ain't nobody fighting because, well, nobody knows what to say. Sister, save your babies. Truth is, there ain't nobody fighting. Hey, nobody knows, nobody knows what to do, what to do. Truth is, there ain't nobody fighting because nobody knows what to say from winter. The impact that that man made and the impression that he made on people. He has helped to transform lives, and that's what he did. Um, and that's what he did for me. You know, there were times, like I said, when we would sit down and we'd have these conversations, and I'd be like, you are crazy, you know, because he had such a very strong person in that personality, and he'd be talking from his point of view. There were times when, if you didn't kind of agree with Gil, you know, you got the ax. <laughs> um, but those last couple of years were like the best years because I saw the best of this man. I had seen the worst of him. You know, I had seen the worst of me with him. But I saw, I saw what God had intended, in my opinion, of, of how this man just we talked about generosity, but just how, what his gift was and how he was using that gift to affect and to touch other people's lives so much so that they were transformed. Case in point, Richard. Case in point, me. You know, but it, you know, the, it, the, the bad thing is that you saw 
all of that towards the back end. And I know that he was ready to, he was ready to start all over again. And he had, in fact, started all over again. The journey just ended too soon. The death you die is so final is not your choosing. Soon, even your beating drums will have no meaning. Soon, even your soul of souls will have no feeling. As sophistication soars and ties are tightened, collars will replace what music heightened. Precious stones that often shine so bright will be yours only in the dead of night. Status symbols that now give purpose to life will be because only for your future strife. In your search for freedom, you left freedom behind. Chains once on your limbs are now binding your mind. I think the second last time I saw him, I was gonna go over to his hotel in London where he was staying. And I said to him, um, as an alternative, you could come to me because my kids are here and we could hang out here and, you know, I mean, it's a bit of a journey from where you are. It's kind of the other side of London. But we can, you know, I can come, I can come to you, but you all can come here. And um, he said, he said, I'd love to do that, but I've got everything but time. Which I thought was, you know, I suppose looking back seemed, seemed poignant. It's interesting to me that he got the Lifetime Achievement Award, Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award posthumously because I'm not sure how, aside from being appreciative, I'm not sure how that reaction would have been uh, if they called him up to say, here you go. Um, he just wasn't really into that, um, those type of accolades. I think he definitely appreciated the support and the reason behind somebody wanting to give you an award, but he didn't have the need to have a shelf full of awards to feel validated. Um, you know, so I think he was proud of, of, of his body of work and continuing to write and, uh, and have a body of work. Uh, and I think, it's a, I think he did a great, great job. You know, we want to make sure I'm not the only one that feels like that and a lot of other people can feel like that. I think as soon as you're introduced, though, it's an easy sell. My father passed away in 2003, and that still feels like unfinished business. And, and this really feels like unfinished business. It, both were um, completely caught me off guard. Both I, in, the, in that relationship, I was at a place of um, looking forward to the future to be more in the relationship. Like, I hate that one of the things that I learned from Gil is that you can't live your life like that. Like, it, you know, what better did I have to do than to go hang out with him? And there was inevitably several times something that made that impossible to go be with him. And that, that stops, you know? That's a very real thing that that goes away. I asked him a couple of times, I said, how could you get tagged? <laughs> You're clever, you can fake to the left and move to the right, how could you get tagged? And he just shook his head. I think that, that from history and, and from life, all of us know that uh, it's hard to dance with the devil and come out on top. But uh, even at his worst, Gil was there. He was in his presence. And yeah, maybe that made it hard for him to schedule his time the way a lot of people do but he managed to pursue his destiny. And it strikes me that, that uh, you know, in the month after he passed, there were a lot of people from the media who called me because I guess it, people knew that I was his friend. And, and, uh, and then it stopped. And there are days I miss my friend. <laughs> We 
we were in, in Virginia, Northern Virginia, um, working on um, the Reflections album, my second album with Gil. Get, just getting ready to record uh, this harmonica solo for this song that we did called Storm Music. And I got a phone call, this young lady who I was involved with at the time was, was giving birth to my, my first child, my daughter. And uh, Gil called me into the other room. He says, look, you know something? This is the spirits, he said, because through, through your daughter, this is how you live on, because you will pass your genes and some of your life force on to her. And um, mid-2000, mid that's when I ran into Gil again. And I, I, us meeting at 144th and Broadway, me walking up Broadway, him walking down Broadway. And I turned, I said, well, is that Gil? I said, look like, so I said, Gil. So he stops and he turns around and the first, he looks at me for a second and the first thing off of his lips was spirits. It's all spirits, you know, so. And it's one of his songs, he said, he said, I was down on my fucking luck. He said, it was no fucking possible way that I could get up now, you know. He says, like your throat. He said, and then all of a sudden, somebody come through and say something, and then get up, get started. I mean, for all they did to him, he went a long way. You can't, you can't keep a good brother man down. <laughs> This piano needs a day off like I do. And now it's time to gather all the things we need to find. Two better days ahead. Just to wave goodbye Better things to do now you and I There are better days ahead Just take my hand You're the one I need to understand For better days ahead With you I can stand Long as you respect me as your man, there are better days ahead. Want you to wave goodbye. Want you to wave goodbye Want you to wave 